Right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julia Wacker, President of the North Carolina Healthcare Foundation and Senior Vice President of the North Carolina Healthcare Association. I am pleased to welcome you to our It Takes a Conversation virtual town hall today. Our program is part of a series of town halls that connects North Carolinians with hospital and health system leaders and other healthcare stakeholders. These are candid conversations to recognize challenges, communicate successes, and look ahead to where we're going next. Health disparities in clinical care are measurable, identifiable, and addressable through straightforward action steps to ensure that all patients receive quality health care. As a first step, NCHA member hospitals and health systems have been invited to sign an equity of care resolution to address racial disparities in, clear, in care delivery. As of today, we are proud that 86% of NCHA member hospitals and health systems have signed the equity of care resolution. The North Carolina Equity of Clinical Care Dashboard, launching this month, will display a statewide view of the progress hospitals and health systems are making to improve health equity on the NCHA website. Next year, improvement work will begin. A few housekeeping items for this afternoon. All lines will be muted throughout the program. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please send a chat to the host and we will assist you. Questions may be asked anytime by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We have a full schedule, but hope to be able to answer as many questions as possible. And now I'll introduce you to our moderator and panelists for this virtual town hall. Each participant is a member of the equity committee and represents a hospital or health system that is signed in CHA's equity resolution. Dr. Roxy Wells, our moderator, is president of Cape Fear Valley Hoke Hospital and MCHA board chair. Our panelists are Dr. Mary Jo Cable, chief executive officer of Cone Health, Fernando Little, vice president and chief diversity officer of Atrium Health, Frank Emery, executive vice president and chief administrative officer of Novant Health and our equity committee board chair. And lastly, Carrie Watson, principal of Watson Healthcare Management Solutions. Thank you, Dr. Wells and panelists for joining us today. Thank you, Julia. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's such an honor for me to moderate uh, this panel with such highly regarded healthcare leaders in our state. And uh, I think it's going to be uh, very informative for uh, those who are joining us. And uh, I think we'll take this time to just jump right in. Um, November, November of 2022 marks two years since NCHA issued a statement on racism as a public health crisis. This panel discussion will describe some topics uh, North Carolina hospitals and health systems have taken since then to accelerate health equity in our state. Every North Carolinian deserves great health care, but barriers to consistent, high quality health care continue to persist. North Carolina hospitals and health systems are committed to working together to eliminate health disparities so that everyone has access to superior, culturally competent care. This panel discussion will describe some steps North Carolina hospitals and health systems are taking to accelerate health equity in our state. So again, thank you for joining us. We're excited to have you. Uh, and I think again, that you're gonna have, um, we're gonna have a really good candid conversation uh, during this panel. So we'll start with uh, our first topic. We, we basically divided it into three topics. And so we'll start with the first one, which really is health equity in North, North Carolina. Um, we know that people and organizations have differing views and definitions of health equity. And because of this, I always like to hear how others define the term health equity. And so with that, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to give me their view and their definition on uh, what health, uh, uh, what equity in healthcare is and what does it mean to each of them? Uh, I'll start uh, with um, Mr. Emery. Uh, we'll go to Dr. Cagle, then to Mr. Little, and then to uh, Mr. Watson. Uh, thank you, Roxy. Good afternoon, everyone. What a great topic. Um, what does equity uh, in healthcare mean? Uh, to me and, and here at Novant, we think about it as a way to say that everything starts with that individual patient, to understand what limitations, advantages, unique features they have, uh, and to try to ensure that the care we give is tailored to that. So uh, then you then there's a second deeper level, you start looking at whether they are uh, systemic or other types of uh, disparities that cause that person to have a 
have difficulty in getting the care they need. But equity in general is ensuring, for us, is ensuring that we give each patient the very best we can and that they can receive it uh, in, in a way that is most helpful to them. Thanks, Frank. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and it does have to start with the individual patient. But a, a way that we simply look at it is that every individual, regardless of the color of their skin, their ethnic background, their income level, or where they live, because we serve both urban, suburban, and rural areas. So regardless of where they live, the geography of where they live, regardless of their sexual preference, regardless of the thing that makes each of us different, right? The people that we serve different, that they can get health care of high quality with good outcomes, that regardless of the differences that those that we are honored and privileged to serve, that regardless of their differences, that they can get high quality outcome, how, when, and where they need it. So it requires a flexibility on our part, and a willingness to understand the differences of those that we serve. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I have to say I echo the sentiments of my fellow panelists. And if you if you feel my smile through this virtual connection, it's because we continue to prioritize this discussion. And then I just want to say thank you to Roxy and NCHA for prioritizing the discussion. And thank you to all of you that have joined us today. So I completely agree with Frank and Mary Jo for prioritizing um, the word individual. Uh, because when you think about equity, you've got to isolate the need of that individual patient, right, and meet them where they are in terms of their acute needs, their acute social needs, and then make them understand that there is a path to a strong outcome regardless of their social circumstance, regardless of their race and ethnicity or any diversity demographic that's associated with it. Um, the only thing that I'll add is there's also this notion of transformative equity, meaning that for that patient, um, we're going to look at any of the barriers that uh, were in place that could have potentially prevented that equitable care and work on removing those barriers from a transformation standpoint as well. Thank you. Carrie? Unmute. I did it anyway. <laughs> I, I, think, I think given the responses from, from all of the other panelists, it's kind of a summary of, you know, the challenges and the realities of what health disparities and health equities uh, really represents. And, and for me, just uh, listening to them, probably a summary would be, as I see it, it really falls into, if you really think about health disparities and health equities uh, in a holistic kind of way, it really falls into four different categories. And, and all of those have to be addressed jointly and simultaneously for you to impact, in, in a meaningful way, a reduction in, in the health disparities in our state and in our country. First category is health disparities, which is really the differences in, in, in the incidence and the prevalences of health conditions and health status between groups and, and, and especially socioeconomically deprived groups. Second, health inequities itself, systemic and unjust distribution of social, economic and environmental conditions needed for uh, living your best life in, for, for better, in a, as a better way to express it. And then health equity, the opportunity for everyone to attain their full health potential each and every day. And, and those have to fall into a category of addressing the social determinants of health. And those four in and of themselves collectively really represents the struggle and the challenges that we have moving ahead. Awesome, awesome. Thank you all so much. You know, I, I was sitting here thinking when I first started my career many, 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 just maybe a few years ago, um, I, th there, there was such, you know, dis discrepancy in what health 
equity meant. And in listening to you all and the health systems across the state that you represent, it seems like we're getting really close, getting closer to a true definition that all of us can wrap our hands around and really make some changes in the state. So thank you for your thoughtful uh, uh, responses. And definitely the how, when, and where, and I and the transformative equity, and I won't, you know, won't pull all those things together. But what I did get out of your answers is that we are coming closer to a, a, a definition that all of us can work from. So sounds really good. I wanna ask Dr. Cagle, um, what can be done on a statewide level to accelerate health equity? And can you discuss how the NCHA sponsored equity of care resolution is accelerating health, is accelerating health equity across the state? Yes, thanks Roxy. So North Carolina hospitals and health systems by committing to the equity of care resolution, have the opportunity to work together to achieve equity of care in a clinical setting by reducing harm events and addressing bias in care delivery. Really, we have the opportunity to learn from each other and get real focus on a few things that we're going to accelerate our improvement in. There are really three phases in this equity of care resolution that we're working on together through NCHA. The first phase is just confirming the member engagement by signing the resolution. The second phase is analyzing our data for the health equity dashboard that we've created. And then the final phase is actually beginning to improve our performance. And First of all, it's that focus that we're all having on those few things that we've decided on. And then the sharing of information across the state on who's, who's doing well and what we can learn from them and really sharing what's not going well and what didn't work. And so there's power in that sharing across uh, the, con the, the continuum of our state. And that in and of itself will accelerate our performance. People don't have to create the same wheel over and over again. Right, thank you, thank you. You know, I think it's, I think it's extremely important that I, I point out that as far as I know, North Carolina is uh, on the leading edge and maybe the only state that's really looking at health equity from an association standpoint and really looking at measuring metrics that will lead to change. And, and so one of the things in kudos to Julia and the team and the foundation for leading us in this work, uh, because we are leaders in the nation uh, in this work and I'm really excited about it. One thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, really for the past 10 years or so, uh, the state really has had an opportunity to pass legislation that would allow us to expand Medicaid. Um, and NCHA in partnership with our hospitals and health systems and our other partners, which whether they're governmental or the business sector or grassroots organizations have worked really to pass expansion. And this year, I feel like we're really close. We, 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 we came together uh, as, as a field and really work to, 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 to do what was best for, for all of our communities. And um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on you know, how you feel passing Medicaid expansion would help us in this work uh, with health equity. And I think I wanna jump to uh, Frank and then if someone else wants to join in, um, certainly feel free to do so. Oh, what a great question, Roxy. So what Medicaid expansion will do is quite literally open the door for people who right now can't get healthcare uh, or, don't, or feel unwilling to get healthcare. So it makes it makes healthcare more affordable for them, thereby making them healthier, their families healthier, which allows us to take better care of our communities. I mean, there's almost, I can't think of a thing that, that Medicaid expansion doesn't help. It helps the providers, it helps the patients, it helps the communities, and let's be clear, the money in healthcare expansion is money we in North Carolina have already had taken out of our paychecks and sent to Washington anyway. So we're just getting our own money back. So it's and I, it's difficult for me to understand the argument against. I'm, I don't mean to get 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 excited about it or or, or annoyed, but in any event, yes. Yeah, so I think it's a good thing. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and if I could just piggyback on Frank, I think uh, I share his same passion. I think, you know, the needs in the business case for the expansion was exasperated in what we saw with COVID because there were um, not only needs to access care with COVID, but then there were, you know, this, this expression of acute social needs that weren't being met. There was a digital divide that wasn't being met. And then there was, you know, some other social determinants. So expansion, Medicaid expansion also gives us a pathway to be able to address some of those other social determinants and acute social needs as well. Uh, so uh, I think the business case is, is, is there. I'd also like to add, if, if, uh, if you look at this in terms of uh, both an immediate and a longer term impact, uh, we all know if you look at areas where Medicaid expansion has not has not uh, been done, there is a much higher risk of hospitals closing as a product of uh, being able to not being able to absorb and support the, the the healthcare expenses associated with providing care. Most of those smaller hospitals are hospitals that fall into supporting those socioeconomically deprived communities where they are much more in need of that care than those areas that have a multiple number of hospitals. And so our longer term issue is as those hospitals close and we deprive those socioeconomically uh, uh, deprived patient populations from the care that they deserve, it is going to have a much, much longer impact decades to come. Mary Jo, did you want to add something? I saw you kind of sit up and said, do you want to add a little bit? Well, I was going to say exactly what Kerry said. So maybe I'll just add amen to everything the three gentlemen said. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, since you said amen, I was listening to Frank and I thought, wait, now am I in church or what? So you ended it with amen. So a little bit of righteous indignation right there. So, awesome. Awesome. So I want to I want to I want to switch gears a bit and really talk about health equity in the context of quality improvement. And we've already mentioned a little bit about where North Carolina is with that. Um, you know, there are many facets to advancing health equity, and I believe we'd all agree that access and the quality of care provided is of paramount importance. And so, uh, Fernando, I want to pose this question to you. To gauge progress and affect change, there's a need to track metrics and share them with the leaders and board members of your organizations or, or of our organizations. Can you tell me how does your hospital track equity metrics and then how do they communicate these findings with the executive team and the board? And then just to add on to that, uh, how might a statewide equity dashboard, which is being implemented by NCHA, be useful? So one, how do you track methods? Two, how do you uh, communicate that to your executive leadership and your, your board? And then three, what are your thoughts on the uh, equity dashboard that NCHA is implementing? Yeah, that's a loaded question, Roxy, but we'll try to get all three of those points here. Uh, let me first start by saying that our journey around health equity data analytics started years ago, and it was really uh, right before the AHA, uh, um, the American Hospital Association, launched their Equity of Care One Two Three pledge. And I'm not sure if you all remember, but Gene Woods, our current CEO, was uh, the champion of that during the time. And 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 the call to action was to start stratifying the real data elements of your clinical outcomes. Look at your core measures, stratify it by, you know, race, ethnicity, language preference, and other diversity dimensions. And then the call to action was uh, to, to collect that data in a meaningful and culturally competent way. So make sure that you have a way to get that data into your systems, into your EMR, and make sure that we can aggregate it and then make sure as you report on your core quality measures that there is that um, stratified component of your clinical outcomes and your core quality measures. And so we jumped right on that. And I can remember, you know, years ago, I was the owner of that spreadsheet at the time. It started out as an Excel spreadsheet, you know, connected to our quality measures, and it just kept growing and growing. And I was like, wow, 
you know, this is probably going to have to go somewhere else. And so we <laughs> put the portal around it. You know, I still have the spreadsheet, though, because I'm proud of it. If y'all want to see it, I can show it to you. But we were able to work with our IAS partners to get it in uh, probably a more efficient uh, portal. Uh, so we now leverage Power BI technology to show what our health equity measures are. And then uh, now we have also used a methodology from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, uh, to, to, to define some of our performance differences and what's statistically different in terms of uh, clinical outcomes. And so from that, that's how we prioritize our areas of focus for the health equity dashboard. So we have a health equity dashboard that looks at all of those statistically significant differences and outcomes by <clears throat> the most prevalent diversity dimensions. And that is a dashboard that now exists in a Power BI platform that's accessible not only by providers, by, but also to administrators. You can stratify the information by geography. You can stratify it by um, um, by um, facility, you could also stratify it by a provider. And so that is the dashboard that exists now. And if you, you know, want more information around what our areas of focus are and what those outcomes are, I'm happy to share that with you. But it's important for the folks on, the, on this call to know that that dashboard and the results of that dashboard are reported on a regular basis to our board of uh, uh, to our board of directors. And we also have a special subcommittee of the board that's dedicated to monitoring this process, uh, excuse me, this, this progress. Uh, it is our health equity and social impact subcommittee of the board. And so uh, from that health equity dashboard, they receive a report every quarter on our progress. So it is, it's very important to understand um, what are your core measures stratified by those uh, key diversity demographics? And then in addition to that, where are your highest um, areas of opportunity in terms of statistical difference in clinical outcomes and diversity demographic? Uh, and make sure that we report on those as well in the health equity dashboard. And the meaningful piece of this with the NCHA dashboard is because it shows a collective community effort. So it shows as we're making progress with certain outcomes that hopefully that's a driver to some of the outcomes at the state level as well. And we're able to leverage that and show the board that as well. And that's what we fully uh, attend to do. Great, good, thank you. Thank you for that. I wanna move to Carrie. Um, and really, you know, we know that collecting high quality uh, race and ethnicity data for patients is critical to advancing health equity, but data alone, we know, cannot eliminate disparities in care. And so from your experience working with multiple health systems and hospitals, can you share some of your insights about the importance of collecting equity data and some of the barriers that uh, impede hospitals and health systems in moving uh, from equity data to action? We want to go from collection to action. So can you share some of some insights about your thoughts about that? Certainly. And, and, I, and I will say uh, the example that Fernando has just shared with us in terms of what his organization is doing is really uh, model for many other organizations. But having said that, I can tell you that I, I can honestly say that it's probably in many cases the exception for, 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 for a number of reasons. Now, all hospitals have been collecting data for decades and we have the data in the systems uh, to look back at, to look forward with. But the question is, once we collect the data, are we collecting data for the sake of collecting data? Or are we using that data to effectively look and analyze in an in-depth, analytical, robust and analytical way to really understand where the impact is? If you think about how long we've been doing this and what the implications are, you only need to go back about 20 years to the Institute of Medicine report, which said racial and ethnic minorities tend to receive lower qualities of care than non-minorities. Now, one would think 20 years, in 20 years, given that we knew that 20 years ago, we should be doing a much better job of addressing those issues now. 
We only need to look forward. And, and I think Fernando spoke about this a few minutes ago. Uh, if you look at the disparity in the pandemic data, we haven't made hardly a scratch in addressing the issues and bringing in equity to the care that we deliver. And look at you know, disparity among Black Americans and Latino Americans on the healthcare disparity. So in order to address this the right way, we have to have a systemic, robust analytical approach that addresses all aspects of care delivery, not just looking at the patient outcomes, but looking at culturally competent delivery based on our, our different caregivers and especially doctors. I mean, there was a article I think it was September, September of 2007 in the Journal of Internal Medicine, which said, and I'll, I'll give you this quote, uh, results suggest that physicians' unconscious bias may contribute to racial ethnic disparities in the use of medical procedures. Understanding where we have opportunities to one, identify those biases, look at the implications of those biases, and then bring that to attention of everyone to drive important and, and, and uh, positive change can only exist if we have the right data analyzed in an analytical way and presented in a way that can be received and drive change. It's critically important and it is opportunities that cannot happen if we don't have a consistent and robust way across the enterprise to do it. Thank you, thank you, I, and I actually agree. And I and 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 in your statement and Fernando's discussion leads me really to the next one. You know, we talk about the collection of data and how we share it within our our systems internally, and then we you know we talk about how how if we don't if we collect data and we don't move to action, you know, over the past twenty years, what action have we seen? You know, it leads me to the to the next thing. One of the lessons that we've, we've learned as a field during the pandemic is the importance of our hospitals and health systems working together. Um, and to advance health equity across the in st entire state, it's important for hospitals and health systems to collaborate and share best practices. It's one thing for Atrium or Novant or Kefir or Cone to, to do the work internally, but if we really want to make a difference across the state, we really have to work in a collaborative manner and share best practices. And so I want to ask Frank if he can share an instance or two of uh, best clinical practices that you, you've shared across your, across your system that can be shared you know, across the state. Um, and, and how can we work together and really thinking about the importance of us working together. And I know that's a mouthful, um, but I think what I'm trying to get at more than anything is how all of our health systems can work together um, to, to bring about change using best practices that maybe something was found at Novant or Atrium or here or where have you. So uh, I'm going to toss it to you and uh, ask you to unpack all of that, all of that question. Well, well, thank you. Uh, this is a subject about which I'm equally passionate as before. So here's here's what I mean. So we, uh, every one of these institutions is mission driven, right? We are, we are here to take care of the communities we serve, um, and the better we are at that, frankly, I'm gonna be crass here. The better we are at that, the more the healthier our communities, the, the healthier their, um, you know, our bottom lines are. The healthier our people are. The, the greater our ability to attract businesses to come uh, and to keep our, our residents in those communities. So let's start with the, the, the self-interest. Yes, that's important. So how do you, how, what is the incentive to share? Well, you know, safety and quality is the, is the um, coin of the realm. So the better any one of us gets at that, you know, we, we share that with others uh, so that we all can, can benefit. How do we do that? So I'll give you an example for us. And so uh, Novant, uh, you know, we, we began some years ago um, looking at disparities in the um, readmission rates by race of, of uh, pneumonia patients. And what we figured out was that Black patients came back more often and earlier than anyone else. Um, so focus, we began to focus on that disparity to understand why that was. And here's the thing that surprised me. I was new here at that time it, to when I learned about it is this. By focusing on that disparity, by figuring it out, it made us better across the board. So not only did we narrow and eliminate that or, or virtually eliminate that disparity on pneumonia readmission, but we reduced the readmission rates for everybody, white patients, everybody, because we got better 
at, um, at, at, at giving the instructions and teaching people what to do. Now, so I'm taking care of that patient today, but that patient is going to be in Mary Jo's uh, uh, place sometime or in Fernando's, or, you know. So, so when when each of us does a better job, it affects it, it affects and helps the other institutions in the area and across our state. So, um, we each of and, and you know and we're just a little competitive. So you know when we, you know if if we put I know that if we publish something and say we did it well, I got a feeling that Mary Jo's team and you know the folks over at uh, Fernando's shop are going to take notice, so they can have an article the next week about how they beat us at something else. But that's all to the good. Of the folks we serve. That's right. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I've always said is until we until we handle or take care of the disparities in care that we see, we will never decrease the cost of health care. And and yes. and not just the cost financially, but the cost in lives, the cost cost in morbidity and mortality. And so I think you know everything that you said about us working together. Um, you know, now coming together is extremely important for, for our state. I want to pivot to to start to talk a little bit about community engagement. And, um, you know, it's important to highlight how creative solutions are making healthcare more accessible. Hospitals and health systems are learning to think outside of the box when it comes to innovative solutions uh, to healthcare, like telehealth, uh, virtual visits, and 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 how they help to promote equitable healthcare to historically under addressed communities. And so, Mary Jo, I really wanted to ask you if you could share uh, why these communities have a harder time uh, accessing care, and what Cone Health is doing to improve access uh, to uh, care to help people live better lives. Thanks, Roxy. You know. Uh, Really, it's not a surprise that uh, some of the underserved communities have had a hard time accessing care. Uh, our, my colleagues on the panel have talked about when you look at the socioeconomic challenges that some of the underserved communities have, transportation often becomes uh, a, a challenge. Many of the households uh, are, are fortunate if they have one vehicle to serve that household, and it's used for the primary breadwinner in that family to uh, uh, go to work if they're fortunate enough to have a job, and that leaves the rest of the household trying to get and make uh, doctor's appointments for children or the elderly in that family, and so if they're um, in a community where there's public transportation, if is the doctor's office on the bus line? not usually, <laughs> uh, and so they can't get there. Or if they're in a rural community, there's not public transportation. And so they're at the mercy of family or friends to get them to a doctor's office. Uh, and sometimes there's not a vehicle at all. Uh, so really, I will tell you, this really uh, came to the forefront for us during COVID as well. We started asking ourselves, how can we do a better job? We dabbled in this prior to COVID, but I think we really blossomed and I want to really congratulate many of my teammates who brought really exciting uh, solutions. We really became uh, very creative with mobile clinics, with big vans, with two or three offices and went to the people who were in need of service. But that didn't work for everybody. Uh, so we began to ask people in the community, talk to the people we were serving, so what would work better for you? And so we set up clinics in some of the churches and community centers. So designing a model that worked for the people that we serve in places where they felt safe and trusting where they could trust us. So that's what we began to do. And then I will say the final thing that we have done that is uh, really a, a tribute to these wonderful nurses and nurse practitioners is our congregational nursing model. Yes, they work in the churches, but they also go under bridges. They go to homeless shelters, wherever there is a need where people are in need of service. And I would say they have become the missing link because they see uh, the people first, and then they reach out to our other teams 
uh, whether they're in the mobile clinics or the clinics that we've set up in churches or other, uh, other places and said, we've got patients that we'd like to get to you in these other uh, facilities. So putting this team and surround care approach, reaching people where they live and where they are has been quite successful rather than our old model of build it and they will come. What an arrogant model, right? Not everybody has the ability to come. And so going to people and meeting where they are absolutely and letting them learn they can trust us, that we can be trustworthy for them has been a, a model that has allowed us to reach people that before haven't had the capability to reach us. Can I, can I just highlight, kind of, Mary Jo, you said something that I just think it needs to be underlined. Let's ask the people what ask. works for them rather yes. than telling you. One of our leaders came to me to say they were thinking about discharging someone from a practice, uh, a, a maternity patient, because she was always late. And, and they, somebody asked her what was going on, found out she had to take three buses to get from, you know, after, you know, and, and to get there. And you hear that and you realize to yourself, we need to go to them. So I just wanted to say uh, spot on, spot on observation there. Well, thank you right. both for that. And, and you know, I, I was at a meeting in uh, California a while back and uh, the CEO of Texas Health Resources, they had received an award and he said something that stuck with me. And it really, it really sums up everything that you've said, uh, Mary Jo and Frank. Basically, it was meet people where they live, work, play and pray. And I thought uh, that stuck with me. Meet people where they live, work, uh, play and pray and you can and you can get you can take great care of individuals. I want to kind of move to a rapid fire uh, because I, I want to monitor our time. There is one thing I want to, to ask though. We know that developing a diverse workforce by mentoring young professionals and encouraging students to join uh, the healthcare field is essential, especially at a time when hospitals are critically short staffed. It's important to include in this conversation what our hospitals and health systems are doing to foster a more diverse workforce. Uh, for instance, Cape Fear Valley has partnered with Fayetteville State University, our local HBCU, to provide paid internships for students at the university to develop a pipeline of talent. And I, I, I highlight paid internships because we have to understand that a lot of these students are first gen uh, college students and uh, they're really kind of making it on their own. That was me, you know, all those years ago. And so paid internships are important, but if you would just rapid fire, uh, give me some of the things that you all are doing uh, to ensure that we develop our pipeline, because I really do want to get to uh, our audience's questions. So it's rapid fire. Well, Roxy, I just want to give you a quick shout out at Cape Fear for realizing that we have an amazing talent pool with our HBCUs in the state of North Carolina. And I think everyone on the call needs to understand that North Carolina, by virtue of the number of HBCUs in our state and the number of students enrolled in our HBCUs, we have the largest talent pool of HBCU students. And so I think that that is something that we all should be committed to understanding where, how we can uh, cast a wider net to our HBCUs, what programs make sense in terms of alignment. And then there's also a congressional initiative for HBCUs that's led by Congresswoman Alma Adams that um, asks companies to sign on and say that you'll provide experiential learning, that you'll provide paid internships, and that you'll you know provide uh, adjunct faculty when, whenever called upon. So shout out to that. I just wanted to call out two more programs one is our Rise to Success program, which goes even deeper um, um, into our schools, into our high schools, to make sure that um, our students are exposed to health careers. And then it also provides an opportunity for those students that are actually interested in nursing to be able to receive financial support to pursue their CNA. And then we also follow those students um, so that we can provide uh, some cohort development uh, such, such that they will be able to go on to get their nurse and their RN um, license. And so we also provide the education, uh, excuse me, the financial support for that. And then while they're going to school, if they cannot work, 
um, in their CNA role, we still offer a stipend so that they can still go to class, uh, be able to pursue what they need to pursue so that they can get that RN. So that's kind of a life cycle. You know, we recruit you in as a CNA and, and follow that cohort in hopes that they pursue the RN. We call that the rise to success and we target Title I schools in North Carolina for recruitment of that. Um, and then the last um, thing I would just call out real quickly is as we work on the medical school in Charlotte, uh, Gene Woods has said he wants the enrollment to be the most diverse of its kind in the country. And so we are uh, very, very um, focused on signature pipeline programs into medicine, working with HBCUs and um, on, on uh, revising their pre-med curriculum to make sure that their support services and wraparound services for students to matriculate um, into med school. So I'll stop there. It's supposed to be rapid fire. I apologize. It is rapid fire. Um, and Mary Jo, Frank, or Carrie? So we partnered with our Black physicians and uh, North Carolina A&T and sponsored Black men in white coats and had 500 African-American middle school and high school students attend that event. It was awesome. That's awesome. Black men in white coats as well, and also working on with a, a grant we got to uh, uh, create apprenticeships, um, you know, from nursing schools. You come to us, we'll pay for your education, and you come to work for us. So, I'm going to get out. Carrie? So, you know, if we were to define the ideal in terms of what our health systems and our care delivery system should look like, one would say that the diversity of the patient population and the community we serve should be reflected into your staff and the, the diversity of the staff should be reflected in, in the leadership and the leadership should be reflected in the board. We all know that right now that is not the, the situation that currently exists. The whole idea of support development and mentoring and coaching is extremely important because in, in a situation where we have the dynamics playing out that we have, those minority, uh, those minority potential leaders, future leaders are not right now receiving the, an equal amount of mentoring and coaching and development. The supplemental things that have been described by this panel are the things that are helping to, to bridge that gap and to support the development of those folks. We have a lot of diamonds in the rough that have not been discovered and are waiting to be discovered and are waiting to be successful in their professions. The absence of doing what we're doing results in those frustrations that cause those critically important people to leave the, the organizations, leave the profession, and leaving us without the opportunity for better development and reaching that goal of equity across the, across the entire spectrum. Thank you. Um, I'm going to transition now to questions from the audience. And as I'm looking through, I think that some of the questions that you've at, that that are asked have uh, you've answered in some some way. And so uh, the first one I want to do, I want to bring in behavioral health disorders and how we can uh, provide equitable care there. So there is a question from Tara in Raleigh. Can you discuss equity for those with behavioral health disorders? How can we upstream services? Um, so who would like to start? Who would like to take that one? I can take it. Okay. Um, so I think we have to be very intentional about how we design our services. Um, we are very fortunate that we were able to partner with the county here in Guilford County and design uh, an uh, urgent care uh, facility for behavioral health so that our patients are no longer taken to the emergency room. Uh, they, uh, they are brought to our uh, urgent care. And so they are not uh, uh, set in the emergency room or brought in, and our police officers go there as well. So people aren't brought into the emergency room in handcuffs. They are taken to a facility that's been designed uh, so that people can be uh, treated in a much more humane without stigma location. Uh, and uh, our staff, looks like the community in terms of its composition by race and gender. And so people are treated by people who look like them. And uh, so the atmosphere 
is uh, one much more welcoming and accepting than in uh, our typical emergency rooms. And we all know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So it starts that way. It is also, we have the pharmacy there. So we're able to give long-term treatments so that we're able to keep people healthy and well longer. So I think it is thinking about, again, innovative and creative ways to treat people removing the stigma from behavioral health. Again, it's looking at your outcome data as well, the same way you look at it with other medicals. We've really focused on the uh, first time diagnosis of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. We know that young African-Americans get early di the first time diagnosis of schizophrenia at a much higher rate than non-African-Americans without meeting the clinical criteria. And once you get that diagnosis, it is almost impossible to get rid of it. And it has a horrible effect for you for the rest of your life. We've done a deep dive into why that has happened and how to prevent it from happening unnecessarily. I would uh, really uh, suggest that you all take a look at the difference in your populations of who gets early diagnosis of schizophrenia. It's the same intentional work with all your other disease properties. So really recommend that you think about doing that because there's a huge impact down the road. Thank you. Does anyone, Roxy, does anyone else Roxy, want to add? Yes, Carrie. Yes, one of the things that I, I would like to add in support of that is I think one of the untapped opportunities that we should really think about is a, a better, stronger, uh, and more effective partnership with both our law enforcement and our emergency services personnel to be able to better train them to recognize and to treat prior to even getting to our facilities so that some of the un the the the, the uh, things that happen before they arrive in terms of how they're treated how they're reacted how they're managed can be better managed with a partnership and training that is I think right now inadequate for our, especially our law enforcement personnel. Thank you, Frank. You know, could I would could I uh, ask you to speak a little bit more about how Medicaid expansion would be helpful in the behavioral health space? I know we talked a little bit about it just from clinical um, in general, but but behavioral health space. How how can how can Medicaid expansion be helpful in that space? Well, thanks. Uh, so in my view, again, you're opening doors to more access to, to the point that Mary Jo uh, raises, you know, the, the folks who may have behavioral health problems get seen earlier uh, and most uh, hopefully in a less emergent situation so they can get the diagnosis and the help they need so they don't end up in a place in, a, in an emergency room or, or, or jail uh, because nobody understands them. So no question that that is is good, and let's be clear. You know, with 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 better funding through um, through Medicaid expansion, they 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 have more at more uh, opportunities for access. More 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 providers, more places will look at them differently, uh, and get and they'd be able to get the uh, the uh, medications that they. So yes, I think it's a it's it's there's a straight line between that and better care for our, our populations who suffer from behavioral health issues. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna to move to another question from the audience. Kristen from Raleigh uh, wants to know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give this one to you, Fernando. She wants to know what is being done to address implicit bias in hospitals across the state. Uh, that's that's a great question, <clears throat> and what I'm what I'm seeing and, and getting encouraged is that um, just like we intentionally prioritize this discussion around health equity with the NCHA, I'm seeing a more intentional effort through uh, some of our diversity, equity, and inclusion infrastructure groups, DE&I leaders, to prioritize the discussion around unconscious bias. I'm also seeing a very strong uh, commitment to uh, helping people understand how bias leads to microaggressions and how microaggressions impacts the experience of patients and teammates. And so, um, having the courageous conversation, building these discussions into our DEI educational platforms, making it mandatory for leaders to understand from the seat that they sit in how they contribute to inclusive culture, 
Um, I think um, that's how we tackle some of this in, in making sure that there is always a correlation back to the patient and the patient experience. So um, I am seeing a greater commitment, um, not only just within Atrium, but within a lot of our health systems to address that. Thank you. Kerry, I want to ask you, I want to move it. Uh, one of the questions that I see, and it's from Emily from Greensboro. She's interested in, in knowing how non-clinical staff can uh, participate in improving diversity and equity in healthcare. And I know she's, you know, when she mentions non-clinical staff, the whole gamut of that, but I also want you to add leadership, um, board and executive leadership when we're talking about non-clinical staff. So, so I think generally speaking, uh, it is the responsibility and the obligation of everyone working in healthcare to be part of the solution and not remain part of the problem. And what do I mean by that? We, we know that all of us, uh, uh, back to what Fernando has just said, all of us acknowledge that we have our own unconscious bias. And those unconscious biases for everyone who touches a patient, who may not touch a patient, who's working in the background, will result in assumptions that lead to biases, that lead to stereotypes, that lead to discrimination in some form or process that in fact then spills over into an inadequate care process, whether it is engaging with a patient in the hallways, whether it is a conversation with a patient around uh, their, their bill, whether it is the board holding the leadership accountable for the data and, and an accountability model for action that comes back. And in the absence of that happening and, and addressing those unconscious biases and awareness, one in training, two in observations, and three in assuming that it's everyone's responsibility to identify and call when it's occurring. In the absence of doing that, we are contributing to the problem rather than solving the problem. So it is a blanket responsibility and requirement against everyone working in healthcare, no matter what position you set in, no matter what level of pay you, you are, to be able to be the champion for every patient every day that walks into the hospital. Absolutely. Um, Eli from Guilford County uh, gave a statement in the chat and basically said, as a public health professional and community member, this panel discussion has been very encouraging and inspiring to hear about the work that you all are doing. Um, what I'd like to ask, because Eli mentioned being a community member, if you could share with, with us your thoughts on how to get the community involved in the best way to leverage community support to move forward this work. It's one thing to do it within the walls, but we also need help in the community. So um, I'm gonna leave it open and, and let whichever of you would like to jump in on that, but how do we, how do we bring in community support uh, and leverage that, those relationships in the community? I'll start, Roxy. So, you know, in the role that I have, one of the uh, things I've taken on is to uh, take on speaking engagements, or uh, involve community organizations and talk about the work that we've taken on in improving health equity and uh, ask them what role they could help have in helping us do a better job or giving us feedback on how we're doing. So it's a uh, both and. Uh, for me, it's having uh, open heart, open ears to hear what their experience of Cone Health is and how we're doing. So I hear from them unfiltered how we're doing, but also asking for partnerships in the community, often with uh, social determinants of health, because truly that has a big impact and we can do many things, but we can't do everything. And often there are organizations in the community that want to help, but they don't know exactly where the need is. But if we share, we as uh, I think Carrie said earlier, we've had all kinds of data, but we can leverage that data with uh, people who want to partner with us. And if we tell them where we could use their help, whether that's food, housing, transportation, uh, I found that there are all kinds of willing partners in our community that want to help be part of a solution if we can show them how the best way to partner is. So through our Center for Health Equity, 
we've begun to develop great community partnerships uh, have, uh, with people who, when we share where the need is and what our data shows, that they want to come and partner. Awesome. And I would, I would venture to think that, that all of us would, would concur with uh, what Mary Jo has said. I want to transition us. We have just a little, just a little under five minutes. And, and again, this really truly is rapid fire. Um, so this is our closing question. Uh, and it's really more personal. Each of you, each of your careers have led to astounding advances in healthcare for our state. And we've heard a lot of things that your organizations and that you have spearheaded uh, uh, in this space. Uh, for those, of, for those of, uh, of, of our listeners who may be interested in really how you got here. So can you talk a little bit about what led you into a healthcare career? And really it's rapid fire because I want us to get our listeners out on time. What an right. opportunity to do something that every day is mission driven. Uh, and, you know, every day you go home, you think, I may not have gotten it all right, but we were headed in the right direction. And so that's, that, that's been good for me. Mary Jo? Well, I had a wonderful family doctor in a little small town in Alabama where I grew up, who when I said, I think I want to be a doctor, he uh, mentored me and helped point me in the right direction. So I want to be a mentor to others the way he was a mentor to me. Awesome, Carrie. Uh, to, it's really uh, my incentive was to to be able to have a career that left me with the gratification that I was contributing to make things better for people who did not have opportunities uh, that I had, and to be able to be at the end of the day feeling like that was worthwhile for me personally. And Fernando. Yeah, the opportunity to grow up as a young boy and provide care to a quadriplegic aunt and to see what that care at home and what quality care enabled her to do, enabled her to finish college, enabled her to go get her master's degree, be a counselor in the community. That was inspiration to me to say, hey, if someone has, you know, quality care, uh, and some in a community of support, they can move mountains. And so that was that was my motivation to go into healthcare. That's awesome. I think for me, mine uh, was I grew up in a rural town in uh, Alabama, and uh, I don't. My mom actually was trained by the family physician there to serve as an apprentice midwife, and I remember her uh, leaving home with her little bag, going out. And back then, you know, you you didn't have to have a midwifery degree. And uh, I remember her going out and uh, helping deliver babies, and she delivered hundreds for hundreds for black women in our community and and it just kind of piqued my interest never thought that this was something that I could do but you know when we talk about mentor uh mentoring programs and opening that pipeline for people of color uh, I had a lot of uh individuals who who did that for me and kind of steered me in the right direction and so I I think that that's why it's so important that we open these pipelines and 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 share our experiences with others um I, I think it's uh, time for us to uh, wrap it up. Uh, you know, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our uh, panelists first, um, Mary Jo Cagle, uh, Dr. Mary Jo Cagle, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Cone Health, Fernando Little, Vice President, Chief Diversity Officer of Atrium Health, Frank Emery, uh, Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer for Novant Health, and Carrie Watson, Principal of Watson Healthcare Management Solutions. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience. And uh, if you have questions or if your question was not addressed, please send an email to communications at ncaj.org. Today's conversation has been recorded and will be available for viewing or listening at nc healthcare.org. That's nchealthcare.org. So please share it with your community. Uh, again, I have had a wonderful time moderating uh, this panel. Thank you to our panels who've done a, a, just a phenomenal job. Thank you to each of your health systems that's taken great care of North Carolinians. Uh, again, my name is Roxy Wells, and uh, thank you for attending. Join us at one of our future uh, town halls. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.